Well, praise the Lord. Dr. Hansen, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you, Shannon? Good. Hey, you know, I'm actually encouraged today. So Good. praise the Lord. I'm great. And I'm on day four of the lion diet. Have you heard about that diet? The lion diet? Yes, sir. I have not. You eat like a lion, just steak and eggs. That's all you eat. Okay. That's all. I let you know how it goes in about 30 days. If I lose weight, it was successful. Okay. Uh, everybody, welcome aboard. We're here tonight with Dr. Jonathan Hansen of World Ministries International. Welcome wherever you're tuning in from here on Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. Dr. Hansen, an honor to be here with you. Do you want to open us up in prayer? And the mic is yours. Yes, sir. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this time. We can come to you right now. We can present your word. We can hopefully, dear God, uh, wake up people to the reality of the situation, how they become a lion for you, how they can become a spiritual warrior. So, Father God, again, I pray that every ear will listen tonight to what the Spirit of God is saying so they can move in victory because we are certainly in unprecedented troubling times, prophetic times. And we need to, dear God, be a lion to go out and win victory after victory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome all of you that are watching on the Warning Television program or listening on Warning Radio, Shortwave, our social media programs. Also, again, we are tonight on Shannon Davis, OmegaManRadio.com. It's syndicated. And um, I want to talk about Take Dominion, John G. Lake. Take Dominion, John G. Lake. All the movers and shakers have all had one thing in common. They were obedient to Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yet, most Christians fail right here. Right here. They make choices which is obviously not loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yet these men and women who were responsible for the great awakening loved and chased Jesus with their entire being. They laid other interests aside, including personal goals, desires, ambitions, jobs, even family, to ascertain all God desired for them. They were not like most Christians today who say they are believers and they love God and they serve God, but in reality... They serve God on their terms. I will come to church when it's convenient for me. I will obey God if it doesn't interfere with my spouse's wishes or family time. I will serve God if it doesn't interfere with my sport teams I want to play on or the sports programs I want to watch. I will serve God as long as he doesn't want me to get up too early in the morning to spend time with him. Or stay up too late at night. Or get up in the middle of the night. To intercede for someone who he has just laid on my heart with a burden to pray. I will but, 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 if, if, if. All the conditions. That's not serving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The movers and shakers named in Hebrews chapter 11 as well as all the contemporary movers and shakers, literally put God first. They would lay aside anything or anybody that interfered with the will of God for their lives. They did not just sing, I surrender all, but did not intend to surrender all. They did surrender all. Many of them gave up careers, fortunes, and even spouses or families. Today's Laodicea church doesn't understand this type of serving or sacrificing for God. 
They have replaced serving God for the love of self and self-interest. Hedonism, in its purest form, like what destroyed the Roman Empire, is what you see in America today. Instead of being able to cast out demons, they try and counsel them instead of casting them out. Instead, they have trained counselors when many times what these individuals need is a demon or legion of demons cast out of them. What we used to describe as laying under the spout till where the glory comes out. In other words, spending time with God and let the power of God fall. This is a song, quote, give me that old time religion, unquote. It was good for Paul and Silas, and it's good enough for me. That has a lot of truth to it. The denominations need to get back to the roots of their founding fathers who chased after the fullness of God and were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit accompanying their lives and ministries. If you're attending a church where your pastor only expounds on the scriptures but has no testimonies of the supernatural manifestations in his ministry as described in Mark 16, 17 through 18, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The above signs must follow all true Christians, all servants of God. I would strongly advise you, if you're not attending a church that believes in miracles, that lays hands on the sick, that casts out demons, that sees God move, I would strongly advise you to leave that church. Amen. Find one that really believes in the Bible. The pastor must be a true Issachar who knows the times and the seasons so as to warn the people about these prophetic times we are in now. <clears throat> and what must be done in order to protect and be spiritually ready for the battle we are facing. <clears throat> if your pastor is ignoring all the reality of what's going on today and just talking about Bible stories, but cannot live the meaning of these stories as far as admonishing us to be real ambassadors of Christ in confronting evil and sin in our lives and the communities we live in, if the pastor has no authority, as described in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. If your pastor has no authority, I would leave that church. Luke 24, 47 through 53. And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I will send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He led them out of Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried into heaven. And they worshiped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Tearing. We used to tarry when I grew up, tarry around the altar for hours after a service. We would pray people through for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I grew up this way. I grew up going to morning service, going to night service, 
going to midweek service, and sometimes nightly services if we're in revival meetings, with hours and hours around the altar. I don't see people going to church twice on Sunday. The Sunday night is canceled. What are they tearing around the buffet table? Where are they tearing? Around the Super Bowl? They tarry more around the Super Bowl than they do waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's more exciting to them. Amen? Amen. Sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal can do nothing but talk. No testimonies. I don't need to listen to that type of person. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. One sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If your church is not involved in these things, if no longer do they seek the Holy Spirit to be baptized in tongues, leave that church. You have a form of godliness. You deny the power thereof, and your pastor is so arrogant, he thinks he can pick and choose the scriptures he wants to obey. Yet he doesn't have a testimony. God would say you're not even qualified until you go and tarry and be baptized. You're not even qualified to preach in the church. Now do you understand why our churches are so dysfunctional? Over half the pastors shouldn't be behind the pulpit. They shouldn't even be there. Leave that church because it probably has a definition of Ichabod, meaning the glory has gone. Today we're going to look at the life of John G. Lake. One, we must have a hunger for God. Lake said, quote, by the end of the year, I believe I was the hungriest man of God that ever lived. It was the yearning passion of my soul asking for God in greater measures than I knew. My soul was demanding a greater entrance into God, his love, presence, and power. John G. Lake. Lake was born in Ontario, Canada in March 18, 1870. He was the first of 16 children. Eight died from illness growing up. Eight died. 16 years of age, he attended a Salvation Army meeting. Shortly after, he knelt down by a tree and surrendered his life to Jesus. He didn't say a sinner's prayer. He understood exactly what God demanded. He knelt down by a tree outside and accepted Christ. He counted the cost, realizing saying words don't save you if you don't follow through and live the life God tells you to follow him and change. 20 years of old, age, he had a sanctification experience which strengthened his faith. You know, as we continue to grow in the Lord and have our time with God, we have encounters with God. We become stronger. The next year, he moved to Chicago to study and became a Methodist minister. He was offered a pastorate, but refused to start a newspaper called the Harvey Citizen. Three years later, he married Jeannie Stevens, whom he later had seven children with. His wife became ill. They moved back to Michigan, where he went into the real estate business. Two, divine healing activated Lake's ministry. When Lake was young, he suffered from rheumatism. Someone from John Alexander Dowie's ministry prayed for him, and he was healed. When Lake was an adult, his family took his brother, who was near death, to Dowie's healing home in Chicago to seek healing. His brother was prayed for, got up from his cot, and walked several miles to help his father's business. 
So Lake was healed. His brother dying was healed. Hope now arose in Lake. And he brought his 34-year-old sister to Dowie's meeting for prayer. She had already gone through five surgeries trying to remove the lumps of cancer from her breast. Now she was dying near death. While lying on her cot, she listened to the teachings of healing, was encouraged. And when they prayed for her, the swelling in her breast went down. The pain disappeared. A few days later, the cancer turned black and fell out. Her mutilated breasts also began to make whole. So she was listening to the word of God. Listening, listening, listening. Faith was arising. She went where there was anointing, where people with anointing could pray. To the healing room. Lake's soul soon became awakened to Christ the healer through these miracles. Lake now summoned to visit his oldest sister, who was at the point of death. Wow, I mean, his family had either died, eight died, and the others were dying. When Lake arrived, his sister had already stopped breathing with no pulse for 20 minutes. Lake watched his parents, who were in such distress at the loss of their ninth child. <clears throat> See, she had died. He noticed his sister's baby in the crib, now an orphan. Lake was deeply compassionate and telegraphed Dowie to partner in prayer with him. See, Jesus moved with compassion. We move with compassion if you are in good relationship with God. Within the hours they prayed for her, she arose from the dead and five days later joined the family for Christmas dinner. Wow. Amen. Compassion. We must contend with the Lord and do spiritual battle with Satan. See, that's a point we need to remember. That's point number three. We must contend with the Lord and do spiritual battle with Satan. Lake's wife, after five years of sickness, now was on her deathbed. Lake contended with the Lord and got so angry, he threw his Bible, which landed open to Acts 10.38, which states how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, how he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Lake cross-referenced the verse and found Luke 13.16, in which Jesus says, that Satan had bound an afflicted woman. Lake realized the battle against sickness is really a battle against Satan himself. Lake concluded that since sickness was tied to the devil, which meant believers had authority and dominion over it. See, the, a lack of knowledge, people perish. People don't, many don't understand this and they just, sirrah, sirrah, just have a good attitude as you're dying. No, 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 no. I didn't take this attitude when Melita was dying in the hospital. Four solid weeks, intubated. Three weeks with arrhythmia. I fought daily. I anointed her with oil. I rebuked the spirit of death when she was dying with arrhythmia. She vomited over the whole bed and her heart came back to normal. Amen. You must know how to fight the devil. You must contend with God. Lake realized the battle against sickness is a battle against Satan himself. Lake concluded that since sickness was tied to the devil, again, we have dominion and authority over it. This meant God was not the author of sickness, nor was it God's will for his people to be sick. If you're sick, be healed. For we must declare our victory. After these revelations, Lake again called Dowie to partner with him to pray. Now, look at this, where two or three are gathered. So Lake is calling somebody that he knows, knows how to pray, that's anointed, that has relationship with God in a strong way. And together, they're seeing miracles. I've always said, don't lay empty hands on an empty head. It's important who prays for you. I don't need somebody with just... Uh, Stories. I want testimonies. Or you don't need to pray for me. Give me some testimonies, not just stories. 
Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you chasing God or Sarah, Sarah? Stand in line, God, when I'm done with all my stuff. Well, I don't want that person praying for me. I want somebody with testimonies filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed, has seen something real. Not trying to argue some point in Scripture. Again, Lake called Dowie to partner in prayer. Lake declared that at 9.30 a.m. the next morning, April 28, 1898, his wife would be healed. Wow, he even gave the time. The next day at 9.30 a.m., he knelt down by his wife's bed, called out for God to do a miracle. The power of God fell on her, thrilling her from her head to her foot, and she was completely healed. He didn't just say, well... Go home. The healing of his wife was a catalyst that launched Lake into the healing ministry. When people heard of his wife's healing, they came to Lake's home also seeking prayer for healing. Five, most churches taught and still teach a lie about God's views concerning healing. I bet you you know churches. I know a ton of churches, mostly mainline churches. They don't believe in miracles. They don't have testimonies. Just have a good attitude as the Lord takes you through this shadow of death. Get out of that church. Lake stated how churches had diligently taught that the days of miracles had passed. Lake went on to say that believing this false teaching allowed eight members of his family to be permitted to die needlessly. Because they didn't contend with God and they didn't fight the devil. They just watched their family members die. Give them a nice Christian burial. Lake felt that this lie taught by churches and still by many today comes from the devil himself. I believe that. Lake worked for Dowie during the day as a building manager and ministered in the evenings. You know, people say, you know, I can't come to services at night. I can't even come to a midweek service. I work all day. Well, he worked all day, every day, and every night he was in meetings. Oh, yeah, the difference is he does miracles and you don't. Amen. You're supposed to chase after God. After Dowie's death, the property investments Lake had made in the city of Zion depreciated, leaving him with nearly nothing. Lake moved back to Chicago, went back into real estate, becoming very successful. Six, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit became the most important focus of Lake's life. Now, he has been moving with anointing because he has constantly been chasing God. He's had encounters with God. He's seen healings. And yet, he wants more of God. He's not satisfied with a level of anointing that most people would be real happy with. I mean, he's even raised the dead. But he's not happy yet. He wants everything that God has promised him. See, that's the difference with a mover and a shaker and a doormat. You say, are you calling me a doormat? Yeah, I am. If you're not chasing God, you're a doormat. You just get there for people to wipe their feet all over you because you don't know victories. You don't know how to have victories. The devil and evil men just use you as a doormat. So they come against you constantly, body, soul, and mind, spirit. Lake knelt down in prayer and consecrated himself to God. Lake attended church services where the minister spoke on the need for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After this experience, an anointing came upon him and waves of holy glory passing through his being. How? He heard the message of the Holy Spirit. He knelt down and consecrated for it. I want it. Father God, give it to me. He testified of being lifted into a new realm of God's presence and power where now his prayers were answered more frequently and miracles of healing occurred more. 
Lakes at certain times aside daily dedicated to meditation and prayer. He had daily time set aside. Not just, well, if it works into my day, if I feel like it. At this time in Lake's life, he worked as a manager for life insurance by day, but preached every night. Are you with me? He preached every night. Following the services, he regularly met with a circle of friends who also were hungry for more of God. Wow, he preached every night, and then they met a few more hours for prayer. I don't know too many people that have come out more than once a night. I mean, once a week, at night. In fact, most won't even do that. They might only come up one day, whatever it is, Saturday morning or Sunday morning. That's it. And yet they want a miracle? Who are you fooling? He met regularly with the friends after nightly services. And they were determined to pray through until God, until they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost as the disciples in the Bible had received it. Lake's hunger for more of God increased and he saw healing released through his ministry in greater measures. One day when he was walking with F.F. F. Bosworth and Tom Hernulch, Bosworth asked Lake when he was going to surrender all to Jesus. Can you imagine? This guy is working all day, every day, preaching every night, staying a few more hours, and the guy has the, what you would think the audacity. When are you going to surrender all? I guess he discerned that he hadn't surrendered all. Lake was so ready the three of them knelt on the sidewalk right there in public and Lake surrendered all to Jesus. He said, I'm still hungry for more of God. By the end of the year, Lake said, I believe I'm the hungriest man for God that ever lived. Seven, Lake fasted and prayed consistently for over nine months for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not nine minutes or nine seconds. And I know people that aren't filled. I know people that don't even know if they want to be filled, which is pathetic. After about ready to give up, Lake was invited by a friend to an all-night prayer meeting to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The group had been praying for a whole year for this, but none had received it. Lake recalled, as we knelt to pray, my soul was in such anguish. I felt I must hear from heaven or die. Within a short time after kneeling to pray, I felt myself being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Then com commenced the most vivid spiritual experience of my life. I was so hungry to pray, so I went with all intentions of praying for the rest. But I had not been praying five minutes until the light of God began to shine around me. I found myself in the center of an arc of light 10 feet in diameter, the whitest light in all the universe. Oh, how it spoke of purity. The remembrance of that whiteness, that wonderful whiteness that had been the ideal that stood before my soul of the purity nature of God ever since. A voice from the light came and convicted Lake of something he had done in his childhood. He then began to be purified. He prayed on his knees for four straight hours, although he did not notice the passage of time. In other words, as the Holy Spirit brought things from his past, even his childhood, he was repenting for four hours. The Holy Spirit. Righteousness. Miracles. Healing, deliverance, salvation. I believe many times we're so filled with ourself that uh, that's why you don't have testimonies. You know, you know, all sin is, it's not just adultery and fornication and lying. It's spending your time foolishly instead of chasing God. That's sin. Can be a hobby, can be anything. 
It's sin. That's why you don't have testimonies. Eight, another baptism encounter, electric spirit baptism, speaking in tongues. Shortly after this experience, Tom asked Lake to go with him to pray for a woman in a wheelchair. Lake went, but his mind was preoccupied with a deep longing for God. Lake stated, now remember, he's asked to go pray for a woman in a wheelchair. But his mind is still, God, I want more of you. My soul was drawing out in a great silent heart cry to God. Oh, Jesus, I so long for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I feel so unworthy, so far from you. Oh, Christ, if it's possible, baptize me, please. I'm so hungry, so weary of doing it myself. I'm sick of sin, sick of self, sick of trying, sick of working, etc., etc. Again, he, nine months of fasting. Presently, a great peace came upon him deeply, rapidly into a peace as he'd never known before or experienced. A quiet of spirit, soul, and body. My being was soothed in a perfect calm, so deep, so quiet. Partly like Jesus on the boat, so calm and peaceful when the carnal disciples were panicking. My mind was perfectly still. I said, oh, Jesus, what is this? The calm of God? Is this the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Presently, it seemed as if I had passed under a warm tropical rain that was falling not upon me, but through me. The realization of peace is such as I have never known. The rain continued to fall upon me. The peace I cannot describe that passes all understanding. This condition of peace was so great I feared to breathe. It was a silence of heaven. The saving rain continued to fall on me. It soothed my brain. It soothed my body. It soothed my spirit. Would it ever stop? I feared it might. I said, oh God, I did not know there was such a place of rest as this. Then I became conscious of change coming over me. Instead of rain, currents of power running through me from my head to my feet, seemingly to the floor. These shocks of power came intermittently about 10 seconds apart. They increased in voltage until after a few minutes, my frame shook and vibrated under these mighty shocks of power, followed each other with more rapid and intensity. Wow. My forehead became sealed. My brain in the front portion of my head became inactive. And I realized the spirit speaking of his sealing in their foreheads. I could have fallen on the floor except for the depth of the chair which I sat. You know, that's something to think about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. You must be sealed. Maybe you must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to tear until we are. Something to think about, huh? When the, when, when the plagues come, if you better be sealed. And it better not be where you're just running after sports or running after games or running after whatever. You better be running after God. And if you don't know, ladies and gentlemen, look all around you what's happening. If you're not running after God now, you know, I don't think you will until blood flows down people's faces. Think about that. Things are happening. We're in prophetic times. Are you running after God or Sarah, Sarah? Frankly, I think you're sick if that's your attitude. Spiritually sick. Again, a change. The shocks of power lessened in intensity. Now have taken hold of my lower jaw. It moved up and down, sideways in a manner new to me. My tongue and throat began to move in a manner I could not control. Presently, I realized I was speaking in another tongue, a language I never learned. Oh, the sense of power, the moving of the spirit in me, the consciousness. It was God who had come inside of me. 
See, that's what we're supposed to be, tearing until you are filled with a third person of the Trinity. And not happy or satisfied till you are. You know, I know some people are looking forward to the Super Bowl. Two weeks away. Why don't you look forward to being filled with the Holy Spirit? What's your problem? Lake's friend had not noticed that Lake was having this experience when he gestured for him to join him in praying for the woman in the wheelchair. See, Lake forgot all about the woman in the wheelchair. He, he was getting his baptism. Lake got up trembling so violently and put his fingers on her head. He could feel the currents of power shoot through her, through him into her. Lake said when his friend went to pray for her, at that instant their hands touched, a flash of dynamite power went through my person, through the sick woman. As my friend held her hand, the shock and power went through her hand into him. I bet that jarred him. The rush of power into his person was so great, it caused him to fall to the floor. He looked up with joy and surprise and sprang to his feet saying, Praise God, John! Jesus has baptized you in the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. I remember in Jamaica, I, I was there meeting with leadership and praying for pastors, having revival, casting out demons. And I went into the fanciest hotel and uh, didn't have the money to stay there, but I went in there. And uh, behind the, the check-in, there was a lady... And the Holy Spirit said, pray for her. I said, pardon me, ma'am. Will you come here? I didn't know who she was. She was a general manager. I said, can I pray for you? Yes, okay. I laid hands on her. She said such lightning went through her. And she was all over the place, violently shaking. When she came out, she says, I don't know what happened, but the power of God, the dynamite went through me when you laid hands on me. And she looked at the, the clerk and said, you let this man stay as long as he wants. Everything is free. Woo! Boy, I had a great time. Ate, drank, slept. Amen. Did my ministry. All at the expense of the general manager who had lightning went through that person because of the Holy Spirit. Because of being led by the Holy Spirit. Because of saying, hey, to a stranger, come here, I want to pray for you. Can you be led by the Holy Spirit? After this, Lake began to pray in tongues for the woman in the wheelchair. And obviously, you should have known she's healed. His enthusiasm for business quickly faded away. Instead, he began to lead everyone who came to him to the, in the business to Jesus. He spoke to his boss about the change in passion and was given three months off to explore the idea of going into full-time ministry. If he then returned to his job, he was promised $50,000 a year, equivalent today to $1 million a year. How many of you would quit that job? Well, I know a lot of people who aren't here today that wouldn't quit the job. That's why they're not here today. God is not that important to them. Really chasing God. You can say what you want. I don't believe it. During those three months, Lake preached every day to a large congregation, saw many people saved, healed, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He quit his job permanently. He sold his estate. He gave his money away for the kingdom of God, relying totally on the Lord for support. Wow. This man was very successful. He could have a million dollars a year. He already had an estate. He sold it all. You know, that will convince me that you love God with all your heart. Lake claimed that a love for mankind, such as he had never comprehended, took possession of his life. He loved people. He wanted them saved. He experienced a new energized power for healing the sick. Power as never before to preach the word in demonstration of the spirit. A strong, forceful exercise of dominion over devils to cast them out. He realized that his own ministry multiplied a hundredfold in the very lives of others to whom God committed this same ministry. Lake, rec Lake recognized that the Spirit flowed through him with a new force and that the healings were of more powerful order. 
He ministered to the sick similar to the way Smith Wigglesworth moved in healing, saying, my nature has been so sensitized that I could lay hands on my, a man or woman and tell what organ was diseased. That's quite the gift of a word of knowledge. And to what extent and all about it, I tested it. I went to hospitals where physicians could not diagnose a case, touched a patient. I knew the organ that was diseased, its extent and condition and location. What's the, what's the sacrifice he made? He chased after God. He laid aside his million dollar a year job. He gave away his estate. He sacrificed and uh, went to nightly meetings after working all day. He spent after the nightly meetings several more hours. He fasted for nine months. I hope you're gathering what I'm saying. There's a sacrifice for the anointing. While he had previously raised people from the dead, raised them, and seen many healings, Lake believed that speaking in tongues had been to him the making of his ministry. That really moved in with power and authority, more intensified than he had ever seen. Constant healings, constant deliverances. It is amazing that even among Pentecostals today, speaking in tongues is reduced to a nice, personal gift. But for Lake, it represented his life in God. It's his whole life. If you've been with me a long time, you've heard me say in meetings all over the world, without the Holy Spirit, I am nothing. I don't have a ministry. During the act of cutting down a tree, he clearly heard the Lord speak to him and tell him to go to Indianapolis to set up a winter campaign. The Lord also told him that he would go to Africa in the spring. Lake obeyed and went to Indianapolis, where he ministered alongside of this Hezbollah, leading people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. During this season, both men had been praying for greater power for the healing of the sick and casting out demons. I mean, I could tell you so many testimonies, like in Jamaica, casting demons night after night after night after night. Powerful witches coming in, doubling over and vomiting. But I just don't have time to get. I would love to give you testimonies, but we don't have the time. It says, Lake, desire and intensity to pray fell upon him so strongly he couldn't even eat. During a six-day fast, he heard from God that he would be able to cast out demons. That same week, he acted on what the Lord had said and cast out a demon from a man who was insane. Three days later, the man was released from the asylum. Lake was caught up in a vision in which he was transported to South Africa and preached. Several times, he visited Africa in a vision before he ever went there. Lake and his family set sail with only $1.50 to their name. Throughout the trip, Lake was aware that when they arrived, they would have to go through immigrations and pay the required $125 to get off the ship. When the time came, Lake stood in faith in the immigration line and trusted the Lord would make a way. All of a sudden, someone tapped him on the shoulder, pulled him aside, and gave him $200. Lake and his family were able to exit the ship, go to Cape Town, and board the train to Johannesburg. When they arrived, the little woman came up and asked if they were the missionaries from America. Mrs. C.L. Goodenough told them that the Lord had sent her to meet them and give them a home. Later that same day, they moved into a foolish, fully furnished cottage. The Lord told this stranger to go, meet him, and give him a home. Again, I could tell you so many stories. When we step out in faith toward the impossible, God and the body of Christ are our only option for help. Something beautiful happens, as it did for Lake and his family. I wish I could tell you miracles right now. And angels going to Senegal, 97% Islamic. 
I couldn't speak the language, didn't have anyone to meet me. And just like this, people would tap me on the shoulder, speak perfect English, give me direction. If you just step out in faith when God says go, the miracle happens. Jericho happened because Joshua did what God said, even though it sounded insane. In his first service in South Africa, Lake prayed for the Holy Spirit to be released to over 500 Zulus. Revival broke out. The church where he had asked to fill in was the same church he had been transported to in the vision before he left Africa. Are you catching this? I have gone to places. And when I've gone there, they say, welcome back. And I said, I've never been there. Oh, yes, you were here. And this is what you spoke. And I went to the very location and spoke. God can translate us. Even if you're not aware of it. God can heal you even if you're not aware of it. One night I prayed. I was so overwhelmed by the spirit of the Lord. The Lord showed me various places which I had would labor for five years. And by the illumination that would appear in the heavens. I knew the extent of the work in each place. That night as I knelt on the floor, I was present in a church in Johannesburg, South Africa. I walked in the front door, walked to the front and into the vestry. In less than one year, I was in that church and the pastor of that church. God did the whole thing. I had nothing to do with it. God showed me an illumination all over the land and the marvelous extent and character of the work that he was going to do. Before I moved back to Seattle, didn't move here, but got off the plane here. I went into a room where I was in Africa for two weeks of fasting. God gave me 33 points and they're happening to this very day. Lake recognized that the power of God moved through him like electricity in this new land. He said he preached in Pretoria, South Africa, where one night God came over his life in such power in such streams of liquid glory and power, it flowed consciously off hands like streams of electricity. I would point my finger at a man and that man would scream as it would strike him. When the man interrupted the meeting, I would point my finger at him and say, sit down. He fell as if struck and lay for three hours. When he became normal, they asked him what had happened. And he said, something struck me that went straight through me. I thought I was shot. At two o'clock in the morning, I ministered to 65 sick people who were present. The streams of God that were pouring through my hands were so powerful that the people would fall as though they were hit. I was troubled because they fell with such violence. And the spirit said, you need not put your hands on them. Keep your hands a distance. And when I held my hands a foot from their heads, they would crumble and fall in a heap to the floor. They were healed almost every one. I know when I pray for people, if I want to have enough anointing coming through me for them to fall or not. I have told people that were threatening Told a man threatening a pastor in a church. If you don't quit, God can take your spirit right out of your body. He didn't quit. And I got a call saying that man fell over dead with malaria hitting the brain. We serve a living God and God can flow through you. If you spend the time with him. He says inside, not only outwardly did he do these miracles, but inside there was such tenderness, newborn tenderness of God that his heart became so overwhelmed he would cry and weep over men in sin. I would gather them in, gather them in my arms and love on them and Jesus flowed out of me and delivered them. Drunks were saved and healed as they would stand transfixed looking at me. Lake continued to minister in Africa. He saw great success. He says he continued in the ministry of healing, saw hundreds of thousands healed. 
At last I became tired. I went on healing people day after day as though I were a machine. And all the time, my heart kept asking, Oh God, let me know yourself better. I want you. I want you more. Regardless of the number of signs, miracles, and wonders he had seen, Lake was hungry for God and desperate for more of him. See, this is the difference. People just don't want God. They just don't want him this way. Hardly nobody. 1908, Lake's wife died. He was away on a trip. Most accounts... She died because of malnutrition and physical exhaustion. When he was away, scores of sick people would wait on his lawn until he returned, so his wife would feed them. While they waited with little food she could spare, she tried to make their stay comfortable as possible. Lake returned, but in doing so, she was phys physically, she neglected herself. And before he ever could come back, she was already dead. Says it devastated him, but he continued to minister. Dominion over deadly germs. Lake returned to Africa in 1910 in the midst of a deadly plague. While Lake was busy ministering to the sick and dying, a visiting doctor asked him what he used to protect himself from the disease. I think this is appropriate because of this <laughs> pandemic. Lake replied that it was a law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. I believe that just as long as I keep my soul in contact with the living God so that His Spirit is flowing into my soul and body, that no germ will ever attach itself to me, for the Spirit of God will kill it. To prove this, he told the doctor to experiment on him. If you'll go over to one of these dead people, take the foam that comes out of their lungs after death, then put it under my uh, microscope so you can see the masses of living germs. You will find that they are alive until a reasonable time after the man is dead. You can fill my hand with them and I will keep it under the microscope until these germs remain al alive and then you can watch them die instantly. They tried this and saw that what he had said was true. Again, Lake said the doctors said that it was the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. And when a man's spirit and body are filled with the blessed presence of God, it oozes out of the pores of your flesh and kills the germs. Lake reflected that if his soul had been under the law of death, or if he was in fear of darkness, then there would have been an opposite result. In other words, you better be close to God. Can't try this and love the Super Bowl game instead. Right. I'd say if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, why don't you forget that and go away and start to fast and pray. Or I don't think you want to try this. He believed that the result would have been his body would have absorbed the germs that would have generated disease and he would have died other than he was so full of God. While Lake was ministering at his church in Johannesburg, a friend spoke during a prayer time. He shared how he felt convicted that he had seen so many lame, blind, deaf, insane, and other people healed, but he had never spent time praying for his cousin who was in an insane asylum. This confession stirred Lake to invite the congregation to call out in prayer on behalf of the insane woman. During this prayer time, Lake felt his spirit transport him through Cape Town and through Spain on his way to the asylum in Wales. Listen to this. He remembered, I went into that place, walked straight into the room where the woman was strapped to the side of the cot. And as consciously as I stand here now, I put my hands on the woman's head in the name of the Lord Jesus, rebuke the insane spirit that possessed her and cast it out. Her face became calm. She smiled in my face. I recognized in the look in her eyes the awakened consciousness. At the time, I'd been kneeling on the platform at Johannesburg. My heart and my voice had expressed my desire to God. 
Not many days later, Lake's friend received a letter from Wales saying that on the previous Sunday, his cousin had been instantly healed. Just like he saw himself translated there and prayed for her and rebuked the spirit of insanity. During the time Lake was in Africa, 1908 through 1912, he planted the apostolic faith mission in the Zion Christian Church. He released 1,250 preachers, established 625 churches. Over 100,000 people were saved through his ministry there. And it goes on and on. 1913, he married Florence Switzler, who was a stenographer. Florence Diligence and her skills are one of the main reasons why so many of Lake's sermons are available today. They had five more children. If you've only had five, maybe, or only had one, maybe you've got four to go. Later, a friend who had worked at the railroad, Blake Lake with an unlimited train pass. This gift enabled him to go to Spokane, Washington for the first time. Even after all his success, Lake's hunger for God continued to increase. In Spokane, God met him yet again. I will never forget Spokane, Washington, for during the first six months I was there, God satisfied the cry of my heart. And God came in and my mind opened, my spirit understood afresh. And I was able to tell God and talk out of the heart of me like I never had been able to talk to God before. God reached a new depth in my spirit and re revealed new possibilities in God. In Spokane, Lake set up the healing rooms and trained healing technicians. Largely as a result of Lake's ministry, Dr. Rutledge of Washington, D.C. declared, Reverend Lake, through divine healing, has made Spokane the healthiest city in the world. According to United States statistics, during a period of five to six years, there were over 100,000 documented healings. 1919, Lake's team ministered to an average of 200 people a day, with an estimated 60,000 people receiving prayer by the laying on of hands that year. Lake also founded the Apostolic Church in Spokane. Queen of Holland requested prayer from Lake after suffering six miscarriages. Lake brought a written request before the congregation on a Sunday service. They all went on their knees to pray for the queen. He then sent a response to the queen that the Lord had heard the, her prayer and she would have a baby. Less than a year later, she had a daughter. Again, I remember, and some of you were with me. This is a live audience. I was in a large church in Bothell praying for people. And a lady and a man came up and said, we can't have babies. They tried everything, artificial insemination. The doctor gave up, said, no hope, no eggs, no babies. God spoke to me, fast five days, you'll be pregnant. They fasted five days and they had twins. Amen. 1920, Lake moved to Oregon where he started another church and set up an, other healing rooms. He had a vision in which an angel opened the Bible and pointed to the day of Pentecost. The angel called him to inspire people to hunger for Pentecost. For the next several years, he traveled and ministered in Oregon, California, Texas, with greater intensity in his preaching. Pentecost! That's what Eagle Saving Nations is all about. We're focusing on Pentecost for the power of God, the third person of the Trinity, to come inside of you so you can do great exploits, so we can have another great awakening in the United States of America, so you can confront sin, and you can save this nation from utter destruction. Amen. Eagles saving nations. Go to my website, www.worldministries.org, www.worldministries.org. Click on Eagles Saving Nations. Be a member today, now. We need 
people to join our ranks. We need a mighty army to lead a revival through America. We need people in every city and every state. I want 100,000 people at the end of this year. We want to be in stadiums, conferences, focused on God, another great awakening. Eagles saving nations. www.worldministries.org That's my website, World Ministries International. Click on Eagle Saving Nations and join today. My phone number 360-629-5248. 360-629-5248. If you need to send me a hard copy letter to join, uh, put a check in it for $50. That's the membership fee annually. Write it to WMI. And my address is P.O. Box 277, Stanwood, Washington, 98292. P.O. Box 277, Stanwood, Washington, 98292. I also need many thousands of dollars. We need another vehicle to trans travel all through America. The ministry vehicle is a Year 2000, it can't travel outside of the city. We need to be able to have a great vehicle. Seats eight, we can have room for luggage and cargo uh, so we can do these conferences and, and meetings and stadiums. So if you're led, send your very best donation to that. Again, P.O. Box 277, Stanwood, Washington, 98292. God bless you. Shannon. Dr. Hansen, what a powerful word tonight. Um, this fed my spirit, man. Thank you for bringing this awesome word. I encourage everybody to share this with a friend and get over to worldministries.org and support this ministry. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. We love you all. We'll see you next time.